The most important thing, people will pay what you charge. And I want everyone to hear that again. So one of my clients came to me like really struggling because she was selling something for 150 euros and it was not sustainable for her and it wasn't working. She said, but that's all they'll buy. I'm like, no, no, no. The reason why they bought that is that's what you sold to them. So we tweaked her offer. We made it a $4,500 package for three months. And guess what? She went out and sold it. Today, we're talking all about sales and how to do it successfully in a pandemic. Have you hit a wall when it comes to growing your interior design business? Then welcome to Wingnut Social, the podcast specifically designed to accelerate your business through increased social media presence, impactful online content, and translating industry experience into physical success. This is your design business tightly fastened. Now welcome the hosts of Wingnut Social, Darla Powell and Natalie Graff. Hey there, and welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast. I'm your host, Darla Jerky Boy Powell, and I am joined by Natalie Sizzlechest Graff. Hey, Natalie, how the hell are you? Jerky Boy. Remember the Jerky Boys back in the 90s? I have no idea who you're talking about. They did all those crank phone calls. <laughs> oh, vaguely. Oh, oh my gosh, you have to Google them. They're hilarious. They have some classics, serious classics. But one of the funniest ones was when they would call people and call them sizzle chest. <laughs> Glad that makes you laugh, darling. You know, it does. a little comic relief here this morning. <laughs> Natalie, I saw on the interwebs this little room air conditioner, and it's supposed to be really quiet, and I'd like to get it for the podcast studio. It was only 89 bucks. Do we have your approval? No. You can sweat. <laughs> for $89, you can sweat. <laughs> I do have a new little studio fan on me here for my hot flashes. So you're having some hot flashes lately. What's going on with that? I don't know. Maybe uh, my meds need to be checked. I think you're having more hot flashes than I am, and I'm 10 years older than you. You know what? I have a better excuse. I am a young spring chicken at 42. I don't have a thyroid, so that might have something to do with it. <laughs> oh, it was a thyroid? I thought that was a brain. Oh, well, <laughs> same thing, I guess. Getting my organs mixed up there. Yeah, yeah. Sure you are. Sure you are. <laughs> Natalie, today we're talking all about sales on the podcast. So during this pandemic, it's been a bit of a challenge. You know what? It sure has. And I would like to say that I have officially stepped away from sales, although I have. You I have not. Well, I still take care of the referrals and anybody that comes in that's a podcast listener and whatnot. Just when you thought you were out, they keep pulling you back in. I know. I don't know if I'm ever going to be free of this. All right. So today we are talking all about sales and sales techniques and how are we going to approach potential clients or potential leads or even be proactive and get leads for your design business. And today's guest is Laura Wright. Laura Wright is a master coach and the founder of Epic at Sales. She helps her clients increase their close rates and their incomes. After two decades in sales, Laura has made a name for herself in the coaching industry as the go-to sales ninja for women in service-based businesses. She wrote and self-published no woman down to teach all women how to master the art of selling. Wingnuts, help me in welcoming Laura Wright to the Wingnut Social Podcast. Hey there, Laura Wright. Welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast. How the hell are you? I'm pretty freaking fabulous, actually. It's one of those funny things. Everybody's in a little wild ride. And depending on when you're listening to this, you'll know what's going on in our local economy, the global pandemic, all the things. And I think that it takes a lot to still stay in a high vibration, but I'm doing that and staying there. Well, we're in Miami. What the hell kind of vibration is that? As I like to say, we're number one. We don't like to do anything half-assed. And speaking of, today's topic is all about how to sell effectively <laughs> during a pandemic. How many times are we going to have the opportunity to have a show like that, right? Let's hope this is it. The pipeline isn't what it was, like, say, last year. I think because of the pandemic, it's still relatively steady. But I always am like, how do I sell our services now and still stay sensitive and be effective during a pandemic? I don't want to be overly shilly and salesy. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to be effective and... Before we get into that topic at hand, what makes you uniquely fit to talk about this topic? Two, maybe 17 important things. Number one, I've got about 24 years of experience doing high ticket sales, ranging from when I used to work in corporate America and we were selling like $4 million events. We did a lot with the event industry. I've sold real estate in high markets and low markets. I've been currently running my Epic at Sales business since 2013. I've been there 
there, done that, sold in all economies. And more importantly, I had a real estate business that in 2008, and I can almost pinpoint the day because if you've ever watched The Big Short and gone through and seen the day that Lehman Brothers fell apart, is kind of the day that my business itself fell apart. So I found myself really at not just a personal low, but like a business low in the fall of 2008, spanning into the winter, starting up into 2009, I didn't just lose my real estate investment business. We had a partnership that broke apart. Just everything you could name was going wrong. And I found myself like $550,000 worth of business debt, $73,000 worth of personal debt. We were hemorrhaging like $9,000 a month. And I am unemployable. I couldn't just go get a job. Yeah, <laughs> when, same. You, when you run a multi seven figure <laughs> business, you don't go to the one ads. So I was really at a loss and couldn't figure out what to do. And what I want to say is that I snapped my fingers and everything changed. In reality, it took about almost six full years for me to pay off the debt. However, in that first year, I dramatically changed our lives. I was with my then boyfriend, now husband. He did not know actually how bad things were. He's now told me 20 some odd years later that a for us being together. He knew how bad it was. He was just waiting for me to come to him. But I sat him down and told him how bad things were. And I started to look around me and decide what I wanted. And from that place, I was able to rebuild myself. And this time I built a business that is based on my skills, talent and intellectual property. So that there's no possibility that no matter what the economy is doing, I still have the ability to run my business and serve my clients. Okay. So definitely you have the credentials mm -hmm. <laughs> to do this interview and the experience for the sales. So during this pandemic, what have you found has changed for you in this whole sales process and the economy? What have you done differently during this time? You're going to love this answer. Nothing different. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So here's what I want to say about that. So my business has been thriving. It will continue to thrive. My clients' businesses are thriving because what I teach my clients is how to be completely unwithable. And when you understand your core values, you don't actually change with the wind. Here's what I want to explain. So I like to talk and say to my clients and myself that I am the lighthouse. I am on the shore. I am shining bright. I am not in the sea. So while everybody else had the ripple of the pandemic start to go in quarantine, and everyone started freaking out and pivoting. I maintained and stayed strong. I showed up strong for my clients. When I say nothing changed, I will say the only thing I did differently is for like the first two weeks, weeks when they announced quarantine, I gave extra love and support to my current clients to help them feel more secure. I only have two clients that I have recommended any sort of pivots. Everyone else, we actually stayed the same. And the two clients I suggested pivots to, one runs a branding and website development company for the events industry. The only pivot we did was we helped her reimagine the way that she sells to talk to people about when you can't do the front face side of your business, this is the time to shore up behind the scenes stuff like your website, like your branding. And that was just a shift in messaging, not even a change in her offer. And the other one was one of my beloved clients who's a doula. She literally couldn't go with someone into a hospital to help them through birthing. So she had been toying with putting together an online doula service. And so we pulled the trigger and got her completely online. Everyone else what we talk about is how to address what's going on, but still sale. Because here's the thing, ladies, you will appreciate this. And I think your audience will too. There will always be something, a reason not to sell. Like I know the political unrest we're having here in the States with Black Lives Matter and very, very important things that are happening just socially, politically and everything. There's reasons to pause and not sell and change. And if you ask somebody, you could find a reason every single day of the week. And here's what I know. My business is part of my activism. My mission is no woman down. It's my book. It's my mission. It's that every single woman out there who is smart, brilliant, and amazing is able to build a thriving, sustainable business. And I learned that when that's my mission, when my core values are strong and true, it does not matter what else is happening in the world. I am meant to show up for my clients. 
Okay, so let's break down your process a little bit. If you're working this, you know, our audience is basically home pros, interior designers, stagers, etc. And they're out there, ourselves included, we're a little worried. What is going to happen to the economy? What steps do you take to become unwithable yeah. and to get those sales going? Give us some basic steps or some takeaways that people listening can say, oh, you know, I could do that. Maybe that'll help increase my pipeline. Absolutely. Okay, so the first one, and <laughs> I've got to find a better analogy in this, is <laughs> I want for you to be able to be like toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be careful. I'll explain this. So here's what I mean. And this is a great example because of the pandemic. So the moment quarantine happened, everyone ran out and bought toilet paper like no one's business. And what I actually mean is this. You want to describe your services so it's so clear that people know where to find you. You go to the grocery store for toilet paper or wherever you go to get it. They understand what your purpose is. Don't need to explain what the purpose of toilet paper is. I think everybody understands. <laughs> I kind of wish you would, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what I want you to hear in that is when you become a critical service, then people can't help but purchase you in good times and in bad times. And I want you ladies to hear this in your audience, especially the work that you do is actually more critically needed now more than ever. Think about how we are stuck inside. I literally moved my office from a small little space in our house to a guest room that we weren't using that is twice the size. And I feel so expansive. And guess what I need to do right now? I need to furnish it. And I need to do this because I want to have a phenomenal feeling in my space because we're going to be in these houses because of the pandemic. So I want for you to start to really rethink how do you language and explain your services as critical need services? How do you show up so that people can see you and find you and understand how to work with you? And then the other thing is this, there is always a way to adapt for people to buy your services virtually as well as in person. Person. I believe that for every single industry. And in fact, I just brought on a brand new client who she does photography. And prior to March, she had booked out over six figures worth of services. She has a brilliant heart and package. The work she does is amazing. The photography is kind of like the extra benefit that you get. The working with her is what's so phenomenal. And she came to me because she is just starting to be able to do photo shoots again. And she's worried what happens if things get shut down again. So what we're looking for her is what is the way that that we can repurpose, repackage her brilliance in an automated and online manner so that she does not have a gap of income, whether or not she can be in person with her clients. That's the step in the action I invite each of your audience members to look at is how can you repurpose, repackage your already amazing, useful knowledge so that consumers can use it and do it whether you're face-to-face -face or not. Even just decorating, like you said, your office, you need to have furniture if that is a necessity. That's people are stuck at home. And we have said that in past shows that that's a tweak here too. But also a lot of designers are now saying, okay, let me maybe shore up my design here, be more well-rounded with some e-design. And we actually just hired a new junior designer for DPI that does a lot of e-design. We're going to add that to our repertoire as well, just to be a little bit more pandemic proof. Think about it. And not just for pandemic, this is everything. And that's also why when I started talking about how what I didn't change was more important than what I did change, because here's the thing. If you just completely... <laughs> right turn, change your business because pandemic hits. Well, then you're going to have to right turn, change it when something else changes. I'm a big fan of adding in. And what I want you to think about is what is different now, but what could be continued different. So when I think about interior design work, what I think about is all my gals who suddenly have a spouse also working at home and they don't have two offices. So I would get creative and thinking about how does that happen? Not just in pandemic, when suddenly a spouse decides to work at home instead of working from the office, how do you create two offices in a one office home. What about parents? You drink a lot. <laughs> yes, yes. You, you drink a lot. You do. I know it's funny. Uh, we're very fortunate. We live in a row home. So we have four levels and we need that because we're all loud talkers in our house. So it would not work for us to be on the same floor. But I think about like, what if parents retire and want to come live with you? How do you carve out additional spaces in the space you already have? That is such an important thing for interior designers to help do. I just want everyone to like hear, how do you refresh and update your services not just pivot.
That's actually an excellent idea. I see the little gears over there turning inside Darla's brain. Oh, no, what's next? (laughs) So as far as close rates, when we go to do a sale, what is a typical close rate? I want to add to that. We had a guest on the show in the past when I said our close rate was about 51, 52 percent. And she told us that we needed to raise our prices. That was too high. I will say this. You probably do need to raise your rates. In my 20 some odd years of working with people, I think I've only had one person I recommended that they lower their rates. But here's what I'm actually going to say about close rates. I always like to say I have a, I hesitate to say a hundred percent close rate, but pretty damn close to it. I don't actually think that you should be looking for many, many sales calls that don't close. So for me, like I spoke to two people on Monday, I closed two sales. I have one more call next week. I will speak to them. I will close that sale. That's what my goal is for my clients, not to have a more sales calls that are needed, but how do you close the people they are actually talking to? So for me, I would recommend that you have a 90% close rate. Oh, okay. So we need to... uh... Do what? I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. So number one is why I have such a high close rate really boils down to two very important factors. One... I know my ideal client like I know, like I know, like I know her. When I got on a call yesterday with somebody, I looked at her and I was like, oh, yep, she's my gal. So I can tell who my people are. It is a gut feeling, split second choice. But the reason why I do is because I know I've written her out. She's so clear to me. In fact, I did a live event. We didn't plan this. I had six of my clients come up on stage for the success panel and they all walked up wearing the same pants. They were all wearing... Um, I don't know if you guys remember the um, Black House White Market. They put them out for a while lofted where it was the leather panel in the front and like the stretchy pants to the back. And legit, they all came on the stage wearing the same thing. Like that's how clear <laughs> I am to my ideal client. So that means when somebody comes past me, I know if they're going to be a sale or not because I know who she is. And the second thing is preparing and pre-qualifying the person so that by the time they get on the calendar, if by the time I speak to somebody, they're ready to buy. And I remember having a gal who she had been following me for, I don't know, eight or nine months. And I asked her, I was like, what took you so long? And she said, honestly, I knew if we talked, I would buy. And I didn't know that I was ready. So... What I would recommend is how are you pre-qualifying and preparing your people to be ready to purchase before you have either a consultation or a sales conversation with them? Okay, so for the interior design industry, let's give the listeners some examples of that. What are some recommendations that you would have for pre-qualifying? Because I know a lot of us, myself included, we just have book a consultation, book a chat to call, and those people might not necessarily be pre-qualified. So walk us through that. I'll tell you, one of my favorite things to do, and I did this with one of my clients who's an architect, what we figured out for her was one of the biggest factors was that spouses were making choices together, but the person who was reaching out hadn't had a conversation with their partner. So what we did was we created a three-step process that they had to go through in order to actually schedule the call with her. And the way we set it up was they would get to her website, they would go and they would book the call. We booked it in. Then we had them fill in just a few questions, but we had them watch a video, which was creating a no like, and trust factor with her and them talking about how she works with her clients, giving like some examples, just really getting some more on the street, get to know me. If you don't like my energy, we probably shouldn't work together. Here's how I work with all the things. And then there was also a request that they reached out and had a conversation with their partner prior to confirming their booking. And that was a game changer. Because again, when you're doing things that are inside of interior design, inside of someone's home, the likelihood that you're dealing with only one individual is actually very low. There's usually more than one person involved. So the question I have for you ladies, for your business and for all of your listeners is, what do I need to know to know if a buyer is qualified to buy before I talk to them? What do I need to tell someone in order to prepare them to be qualified to buy before we talk? When you can answer those two questions, you put that into your prep before you get on a conversation. I love that. And let me ask your opinion on putting prices on your website. Ooh, I have a very distinct opinion on this. Okay, so number one is I do not put price tags to things unless there is a sales page. So if you have an entire long form sales page that describes every single thing that you're doing and at the bottom of that page, it's click to buy, put your price tag on there. What I usually recommend for most of my clients, especially when work is customized, I usually do starting at X number or going up to this 
this. I also love using terms such as this is an investment. It's usually a percentage of the cost of your home. I equate it because here's what actually people need to know in a buying situation. So when I'm going to go buy something, the very first thing I start to think about is, okay, how many clients do I need to take on to cover this cost? Like I already start to equate the numbers. Most people don't do that. So what I want you to bring into your sales conversation is showing somebody the value benefit to buying from you in something that they can see tangibly. I'll give you another example. Right before we bought the home that we're living in, we decided we were going to stay in our old home for at least three more years. And I'm very grateful we didn't because we need more space now during pandemic times. But I was like, you know what? I think we need to update our windows. So I went and I purchased, it was like $10,000. So we only had like nine windows in our house. And of course, we went and put our house on the market like three days later after they were done. But part of why I made that $10,000 investment was when I looked at how much we wanted to potentially sell our home for, how long we were planning on staying, I could see that I could pull that $10,000 value back out of my home. So what I want for you to look at is it's different for everybody. But if you can show someone that value, they will put two in two together to buy. For interior design, what I want you to ask people is, how do you feel in your house? If you look around and you are like, I can't stand this. You either go into work or start working with your clients. That energy comes into the rest of everything you do. It's going to show up in your sales. It's going to show up in the quality of work you do. If you're up for a bonus, you're going to feel ucky. You might pick lower level clothing because you don't like your space. Think about like if you and your spouse are fighting because every time you go to sit down somewhere, there's like only one comfy seat and he's got it or she's got it instead of you. Like think about all those things, but I want you to bring them to sales calls because most people are not sitting around thinking about what their actual struggles are and what their actual vision is and how much it's draining them. Another good example, and then you guys have to shut me up if you want me to talk. I remember we had three little things a miss in our house. It was like a back door handle wasn't working. Our fence, you had to do that little thing where you stick your foot underneath it and lift it all up and put like there were these little things, but they were energy drains. And we kept putting off getting them fixed. And I finally hired somebody and it was like a couple hundred bucks. Everything was taken care of. And all of a sudden I realized how much mental energy and frustration was being created in my day to day existence by these little tiny things and how quickly and easily it up leveled everything for me. So that's what I want to say about like all those little pieces. But please, please, please more questions. I love them. Well, I want to know what you mean when you say close a sale with love. I believe in creating win, win, win. I believe that when you work with somebody, it should feel so amazing. Like you completely believe in them, believe in their vision. It's a win for them and a win for you. And another way I like to explain it is this. If you were going to sell something to somebody that was going to maybe hurt their marriage, like let's say that they really, really wanted something and the spouse was completely against it, but you're like, come on, you got to make it happen. Make it, it's going to be great. (laughs) And they say, yeah, yeah, I'll make it happen. And then you know, there's going to be strife and back clash to this decision, that's not selling with love. That is conversion and persuasion. When I say selling with love, what I mean is the other person benefits as much as I benefit and together we all win. What I mean also by this is helping people fully believe in themselves because ladies, you think that what you're doing is interior design and that's not what you're doing. What you're helping people do is actually feel fully empowered with self-expression. You're helping them feel lifted up by their environment in their highest level self. And when they feel fantastic, high probability, they're going to go in the world and do good things. That's what I mean when I talk about selling with love. I love that because we're not really selling the service as much as we are selling the feeling that people get from the service about themselves and about their daily life. Now I'm going to throw it around because you said that you have almost a 100% close rate. What do you do with a client that initially said no or maybe? How do you pursue them? Yeah, I love, love, love that. Okay, so here's what I know. When someone comes to you to work with you, they are ready and the time is right. When they say later, here's what actually happens. They go off and they become a different person and the work that you are going to do together probably no longer matches. So for me, I do like to stay in the land of, hey, when it's time, it's time, please step forward. And then I always say this, I'm going to be around for a very, very long time. So when you're ready, I will be here. What I do when I'm doing any sort of follow-up, and I'm a very big fan of follow-up, is I release outcome and I also give deadline for a decision for what it is that I've offered to them. This is happening right now. I have a woman who I spoke to a certain amount of time ago. I spoke to her. It wasn't very long ago. I had my team send her a contract. We had a great conversation. She's like, I'm all in and... 
I actually need to go talk with my spouse. I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And I said, fantastic. I need to hear back from you by Friday at 5 p.m. for this invitation to still be available. If I don't hear back from you, then it's not available to you anymore. And I said this with more nuance and a lot of love. And I know what she's going to do is she needs to go sit and digest with it because here's what I really want you to hear. There are different types of buyers. So some of us are meant to buy on that first call. Some people actually need to leave the call, digest the information, formulate an opinion, and then come back and say yes. So if you understand who you're talking to, you know exactly how much to give to them to have the follow-up. But one thing I really you know want you to catch to is that there needs to be boundaries. We're creating a sales container. So I don't do a hey, call me whenever. I set a very firm boundary. Either we're either going to speak on a phone call, we're going to receive an email, we're going to do a Voxer or a text or something by a certain time and date to close the loop versus having it be open and forever. You know, that is something we started doing. Natalie started sending the close the loop emails and now she's very, okay, let's make a date to review the proposal on this and such and such and such a time. And she books it. That actually has worked out a lot better. Yeah. The interior design side, it's great. On the proposal that we send over for the agreement, we put that you have X amount of days and we just had a young lady buy her first home out in San Antonio, Texas. And she emailed back. She goes, I know I'm getting close to that date. Things have changed. Don't go anywhere. Please let me (laughs) accept this. (laughs) is what I need. So it works. You know, proof is in the pudding for sure. And I can tell you why it works. I want to give you the psychology behind it. I feel like when people understand things, they get better on board with it just then, oh, I did it and it worked. So what you're doing is you're actually applying internal and external pressure. And so what most people do is they only use external pressure where they're like, if you don't buy by this day, it's not going to be this price or you only have this amount of time. But in a sales conversation, when you can activate internal pressure, and I mean, this is a positive way that internal, I want to have this for this reason, and you balance it with the external, then you know you're going to get to a yes. I love it. Let's shift just a tiny bit here. You wrote a book called No Woman Down. Tell us a little bit about your book. Is that the unfortunate part? Yeah, it is. That is. So here's what (laughs) happened. I'll tell you a funny thing. So I was having kind of like one of those down moments and my husband said something to me. I had something that didn't work. Because, you know, we're entrepreneurs, we try things. And I said something about how I feel like I keep falling down, like things keep not working. And he's like, what are you talking about? All I ever see is how you rise up. And I was like, what? But I mean, he's my significant supporter, my favorite supporter. (laughs) So I decided to um, like really look at that and see the pattern of my life of what did I do to change my circumstances every time I rose back up. And so I wrote a book that just distills, we call them laws because those are my initials, L-A-W. And my copywriter, (laughs) when we were writing things, she was like, Why do some of them have law at the end? They're just 51 little uh, excerpts. They're little stories with little action items you can take. And I'm like, it's not law. It's my initials. I was approving it. She's like, I think you should call these laws. So basically what they are is there are 51 little lessons that you can use to create motion, action, and sales to create income rises in your business and your life. And I love things being short, sweet, and actionable, just like me. Um, (laughs) I'm like one, (laughs) And... What I really want is, again, my mission is based around the fact that I believe that really powerful, smart women, when we hold wealth, when we are able to access resources and money, we do not just help ourselves. We help our communities. We help the world. And I believe firmly that women need to understand how to rise up, overcome, and create sustainable wealth. Oh, I need that book. Is it available on audio? Is it not available on audio? Uh, you know what? Okay, now I know. I, hold on. I'll message my assistant. Um, I'll tell her it needs to be happen. Uh, that would actually, you know what? I can I can actually do that. But we do have it as a downloadable PDF. And it's also on Amazon. So you can get it physically in your hand. But what I love about it is it's also, you gals get this. As entrepreneurs and business owners, we can sometimes get stuck in our head. Or we try something and it doesn't work. And my book is kind of like a little choose your own adventure motivator. So you just can kind of thumb through it and pick a lesson, read it get a little insight, inspiration, and then I have a little action step. And most of my action steps are like one step because I do believe that motion fixes almost everything. I love it. Laura, is there anything that I haven't asked that you think is important for our listeners to hear before we get into the what up wing around? The most important thing, people will pay what you charge. 
And I want everyone to hear that again. So one of my clients came to me like really struggling because she was selling something for 150 euros that it was not sustainable for her and it wasn't working. She said, but that's all they'll buy. I'm like, no, no, no. The reason why they bought that is that's what you sold to them. So we tweaked her offer. We made it a $4,500 package for three months. And guess what? She went out and sold it. So people will buy what you are offering. So if you look around at your clientele and you think, well, I mean, I have a $100,000 mastermind. It's a very select few. It's a very special program. And how do I get clients for it? Because I have it to sell. If I had a $10,000 program, guess what? I would get clients to buy a $10,000 program. So ladies, step your game up. Natalie, we have a $100,000 webinar coming up. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Speak your value. But for real. I love that. that. That's terrific. Laura, you have given us some amazing takeaways. And now I have to ask you if you're ready for the What Up Wingnut round. I am. Now it's time for What Up Wingnut. Wingnut. If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be and why? Money tree. Uh, the reason why I'd be a money tree is because I have one in my office. I give them out to my gals. And I know that as you nurture and flourish that, so does my income. Very nice. Does that really work? It does. Like I had to tell you, I was so afraid I needed to replant my money trees. It gotten too big for its little bucket. And I was afraid to do it because when you replant trees, sometimes they can die. And so I've been watching this sweet little thing, like all its little baby leaves are kind of falling apart. And I'm like, come on, you can keep going. I know you're okay. <laughs> but that's actually very much a metaphor to our own lives. We need to replant ourselves into big situations and have our, you know, our ceiling become our floor again. Note to self, get a money tree. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Hashtag epic life. If you could have only one superpower, what would it be and why? Ooh, flying. <laughs> I'm like so in the like, let's go fast. I'm like, what's the, the why portion is why I would love to fly is because I love to travel and I am actually really missing it. And the thing that I actually like is to get there quickly. I have kind of like a three days feels great for travel. At day four, I'm starting to miss my family. At day five, I wish I was home. So I wish I could fly. I'm the same way. I get homesick bad. Last but not least, please recommend a book that has had a profound effect on you either personally or professionally besides the one you wrote? The Big Leap. Oh, I love that. Yeah, Gay Hendricks. Gay Hendricks. I have to say, I remember that one and I want to do a double, I have to say too. Mike Dooley, Leveraging the Universe. Mike Dooley's Leveraging the Universe was a game changer for me because I used to, like one of the magic things I do with my clients and why they all get results is because we don't just find one way to hit your goal. We find like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, however many ways we need to. And that just like calms your psyche down. It gives gives you less pressure, easier way to hit your goals. And Mike Dooley's Leveraging the Universe talks about how to activate the universe side, whether you call that God, source, spirit, physics, science, universe, anything. And the moment I started doing that, things became even easier. And Gay Hendricks' book, The Big Leap, what I love about that book, oh, I want to give a third one to you. Price Pritchett, You Squared. What these three books have in common is what I like to call creating epic leaps. It's where you counteract physics and you don't have to go step one, two, three. You go step one to Z. You can do that in your life. I love the, the Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. I'm always citing that as my top book that had the most impact on me in running my interior design firm, for sure. So, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. Please tell the Wingnuts listening where they can go seek you out for your awesome sauce sales services. Absolutely. So go to Laura Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, coaching.com. And when you get to my site, you will see all the goodness. Click and get on a call if you feel like you want some love and support. There's access to get to my book and also my Five Steps to Yes, which is the easiest way to create sales. I believe in a formula and a path to follow, but not a script. Got it. Awesome. Thank you so much for being an amazing guest. Laura, you have a terrific week. You as well. Thank you so much, ladies. Natalie and Giraffe. Yes, Jethro. That's the first recommendation we have from a guest for The Big Leap. By Gay Hendricks. Yeah, I know. Well, it's good. I love her confidence. I love what she had to say. I love ask your worth, you know, no woman down. I think you might have to go read that, Darla. You know, it's funny, too, that she mentioned, you know, the game changer for the architect about having both decision makers aware of the phone call. You know, haven't we found that on the design side that if we have a situation where only one of the parties is involved and not the both, that it kind of tends to go south? Sometimes? Yeah, it goes like back and forth. Well, I got to talk to this one. Well, I got to talk to that. Well, wait, what does this one say? And if we actually straight up 
said, listen, we'll be glad to give you guys a proposal, but we would like to talk to both of you yes. at the same time. And I tell you, nine times out of 10 since we've started doing that, mm-hmm. it just makes life a lot easier. She is totally right. Some people are ready to buy right there on the spot. Okay, where do I send a check? Where do I sign? What do I do? And some of them are, okay, well, we're going to discuss this tonight. And usually by the morning, I hear back from them. So well, we had that with uh, clients we just signed. I think we went out to see them in January. They were totally thought about it for what, five months. Yeah, they did. <laughs> and now sign back up. Also, I wanted to mention, just as an aside, the new project that we got in Texas that Rex and I are excited to fly out there. Uh, we got from a lead from Instagram. Social media works. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I mean, seriously, one project from Instagram pays for your marketing for a whole year, just about if you have a, the right project. So just think about that. All right, guys, that's it for this week. If you guys like what you hear, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. I think we have like 300 and some odd reviews on there. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. It helps people to find us and it shows us that maybe we're doing something right. Sitting in here staring at each other without any immediate feedback. It's like, are we doing an okay job? I'm not sure. Be sure to follow us on social at Wingnut Social. And if you need help for your interior design firm to get the word out there, increase your reach and get real clients, one 877-WINGNUT. Operators are standing by. Or you can send us an email at info at wingnutsocial.com. And we are at Wingnut Social on all social media. Got anything else? Nope. So long. See ya. You've reached the end of this episode of Wingnut Social, but that's only your first step. Be sure to head to wingnutsocial.com to reach out to us directly and schedule your free consultation with one of our Wingnut Social Media Specialists to take your business from social mediocre to social media master. We'll see you on the next episode of Wingnut Social, your social media tightly fastened. Sounds good to me. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. We're going to (laughs) fart. All right. Well, that's just the way it is. I need to be able to stalk you. You only need to be able to stalk me when I'm in the boat. No, that's not true. Good boy, Mango.